Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Midwest Vascular uh, Surgical Society's uh, New Horizons webinar series. This evening, we are very lucky to uh, welcome three wonderful speakers, and I would also like to welcome my co-moderator, Manju Kalra, who's uh, at the Mayo Clinic in um, Minnesota, and I, of course, am Kelly Brown. I'm at the Medical College of Wisconsin. Um, today's webinar is Surgical Site Management Algorithms for Prevention and Management of Complications. And we'd like to very much thank our sponsor, 3M, for helping us put these educational seminars on. Our first speaker this evening is Dr. Will Robinson, who is Professor and Division Chief of the Division of Vascular Surgery at Southern Illinois University. Will? He is going to speak to us tonight about uh, lower extremity surgical site uh, challenges after bypass. Thanks for joining us, Will. Thank you, Kelly. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Manju. Thank you, the Midwest Vascular, for inviting me to participate in this webinar. webinar. Um, I'm going to start by giving a little overview of lower extremity surgical site challenges after arterial bypass. So, just to start, why are we talking about complications of open lower extremity surgery anyway, now that we're in the endovascular era? And I, I think the, the reality is, although a, the most uh, revascularization now is done endovascularly, lower extremity bypass remains effective and durable. We know we can do it with low cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. It's really adaptable to anatomically complex PAD that can't be treated endo. And it's going to become increasingly necessary as we treat the restenosis epidemic. However, it does have an Achilles heel, and that's the Achilles heel of wound complications. And I think we all know that any number of complications can occur, and they're often overlapping dehiscence and necrosis, hematoma, seroma, lymphocytes, and fistulas, true surgical site infections, and in the worst case, vascular graft infection all coexist and often with post-operative edema, which occurs in most patients. I think the reality is that over the last 30 years in the literature, a lot's been written about this, but overall wound complications after bypass are underreported. And I, I believe they're still underappreciated or maybe at least undersold to patients. If you look at most single institution reviews or reviews of inpatient registries, Generally, what's quoted is major wound complication rates, and those generally hover in the 2 to 5% range. But if you take a look at certain subsets of the literature, here a randomized trial on a silver dressing, and in the other paper I cite, a statewide database paper, we see that the rates of surgical site inspections and wound complications are really much higher. In this randomized controlled trial, which would be thought to have really the best surveillance and potentially the best attention to care, there's a 30% wound complication rate. And in this, minute, in this Michigan multi-institutional study, 10% surgical site infection rate, um, really high, high numbers. If we look a little deeper and you start thinking about any wound complication, and I think I'd say it gets really hard to differentiate between what is a wound complication or what is a major wound complication. I think the reality is that many of these are might start minor, but turn into major problems. And if you look at the literature, there's a variety of evidence that the rates are really quite high, all the way up to 31%. And that's the case for both infrainguinal bypass with autogenous vein, with prosthetic bypass, and actually any procedure which requires a groin incision in some studies has been reported to have surgical site infection in up to 30% of cases. Now, what does that lead to potentially? Well, there's a lot of downstream effects, but one of the, the most major that we need to care about is readmission. So this is a huge problem after low extremity bypass. This study from Boston examined the readmission rates in an academic center after 350 lower extremity bypass, most of which were vein grafts. 
and the 30 per, 30 uh, day uh, readmission rate was 30 percent. I think this paper is interesting. It went a little farther. I think we know that not all of these problems occur within 30 days. 90 day readmission rates of 49 percent and one year readmission rates of 72 percent, a great majority of which are due to wound complications. Overall, we know that there are a whole host of bad outcomes associated with surgical site infection after lower extremity bypass, increased length of stay, increased readmission, as I just said, increased cost, reoperation, and actually severe outcomes for the patient as well, increased rates of 30-day graft loss, increased amputation rights. And I think ultimately one thing that we minimize is really increased patient burden and hardship. Here's an example that our wound care center uh, who I work with took example, uh, took care of. This is a 61-year-old female status post of femboloni pop bypass, both horrible green, groin wounds as well as saphenous harvest and below knee wounds. This is ultimately a six-month process of wound center visits, painful dressing changes, painful compression, you know, strict attention to multimodal therapy. Really, this is just an awful lot for uh, patients to go through in addition to the burdens on our, on our healthcare system. Of course, I think it's worth reviewing the CDC criteria for surgical site infections. They're ultimately classified into superficial infections, deep, infe deep uh, surgical uh, uh, site infections, and so-called organ or space infections. These all have requirements for this, uh, the amount of symptoms and the uh, physical exam signs that are present. And I think what's notable is that when we're talking about an autogenous arterial revascularization, we measure these in the traditional sense of a surgical site infection occurring within 30 days. But when we're talking about a prosthetic device or implant, such as a pr prosthetic bypass, we should be calculating this rate up to one year. In clinical practice, here's what these look at. And I think we've all probably seen these, everything from superficial groin problems to a deep groin problem where a deep groin abscess ultimately causes dehiscence and erupts through the skin to what we call an organ or space infection involving a great majority of a graft or soft tissue beyond the incision itself. What's the bacteriology of these problems? Well, I think you know, most of these are staph aureus. And unfortunately, over the last 20 years, an increasing number of these have become MRSA, which is a lot harder to deal with. In recent years, we've seen an increasing number of gram-negative infections, up to 25% of surgical site infections now, also exceedingly virulent. And coexistent with this has been an increase in staph epi infections involving vascular grafts. There are a number of reviews out there which do a really good job of identifying all of the risk factors for surgical site infection. The bottom line is that it's a complex interplay of patient factors, procedural factors, and in your environment. And through the literature, you can find uh, a vari varieties of sources of evidence that point to each of these factors uh, as being extremely important or high risk for surgical site infection. As a result of the of, uh, CDC-driven measures over the last 20 years, there have emerged certain strategies which have been shown to prevent surgical site infections. And these are things that we do every day in practice, surveillance for MRSA, decolonization of bacteria on the body, antibiotic prophylaxis. There are certain well-known elements of post-operative care such as sugar control and O2 saturation that are associated with preventing infection, incisional care, hand washing, and patient and family education. But despite 20 years of serious attention from the CDC, payers, all other stakeholders, and a lot of guidelines, we actually have very little evidence that we've had procedure-specific reduction in surgical site infections in lower extremity bypass, and in fact, vascular arterial uh, procedures in general. Why is that? Well, I think part of the reason is the demographics of our current patients. We're seeing patients with an increasing amount of diabetes exponentially although we do happen to see less smoking now in our population. But I think more important than these is we have an obesity epidemic. If you just look here at our Midwestern states involved in the Midwest vascular, you can see obesity rates that are really all above 25%. 20 years ago, these were all between 10 and 15%. And 
So this is probably maybe the major factor that's yet to be fully accounted for. So what about lower extremity bypass in the so-called endovascular era? I think this is one reason why uh, there are differences here, and it's one reason why bypass infections have not tapered off significantly despite a lot of effort. I think the bottom line is we're doing more bypasses for CLI than for claudication. We're only bypassing more advanced complex disease. All the easy stuff is being treated with endovascular therapy. So they're more often requiring multi-level multi procedures, including extensive femoral dissections and longer operative times, which is a high risk factor. And uh, I think we know that more advanced disease is associated with more severe comorbidities and frailty. And I think all these add up to really uh, a constant um, uh, complication rate that we've been unable to make a dent in. There are also some specifics of lower extremity wound infections that don't exist in other, uh, in other wounds, in other parts of the body. The nature of a groin dis dis uh, incision disrupting the lymphatics, the uh, latent tissue injury of the presence of CLI, revascularization edema, hematomas and seromas, as well as dermal and fat necrosis, which commonly occur after bypass, trauma due to our own factors, such as electrocautery and wound retractors and coexistent venous stasis. And I think many of you have probably had a patient like this of mine where everything's gone beautifully in a very hard perineal bypass, uh, but you're plagued by this, this um, problematic wound that is just very difficult to heal and, and very difficult for the patient. If you look at the lymphatic drainage of the limb, it's no wonder why our uh, lower extremity bypass leads to problems. Look on the right-hand picture of the, the uh, lymphatic distribution from the lower leg, and you can see that all of the leg really coalesces in the groin. And so any groin incision is going to disrupt the entire lymphatic drainage, not only of the leg, but also of the lower abdomen. And so, and there's going to be downstream effects on all of these areas, lymphatic drainage down, down, the, um, down the entire leg. Most of these also travel up the course of this greater saphenous vein. And our ideal conduit uh, is greater saphenous vein from the ipsilateral leg. So I think this puts us at even higher risk for, uh, for difficult problems with uh, wounds, primarily due to problems with lymphatic drainage. I think post-op edema management is key and a variety of, a variety of uh, interventions have been shown to reduce that. I wanted to make a few comments just on technical aspects of interest for discussion that won't be covered by Dr. Bakai and Dr. Weston. And all of these things are really talks in themselves. So I put them out there for discussion by the audience. I think we always think about, well, what about endoscopic vein harvest? And I think the bottom line on my review of the literature is that this has mixed results in the, um, in terms of wound infections, but certainly reduce, seems to reduce great graft patency. There's really very little evidence on closure technique. Is monocryl superior staples for long leg incisions? Well, there's really weak evidence of benefit as part of protocol bundles, but that's it. And a few key technical pearls that I think are, are, are worth discussing is alignment at the groin crease, the use of skin bridges, although here the evidence is still equivocal, the avoidance of harvest flaps. In my experience, I think this is especially problematic with a very posteriorly located greater saphenous vein. And I think it's very hard to measure, but it's certainly important to have uh, ultrasound available to map the vein so you can have meticulous planning of your incisions that are gonna allow you the best accommodation of both vein harvest as well as the arterial, arterial exposures that you need. And one of my you know, personal beliefs is that avoiding dermal tension in your closure with too many layers of closure uh, is, is important for avoiding necrosis. One other issue I'll mention here is the presence of foot wounds. So we, all, we, we often do bypass for CLTI in patients with gangrene or wounds, not actively infected, but sort of dormant and gangrenous dead tissue. Um, some residents and I previously looked at this issue and wanted to look at whether doing your concurrent and current foot resection, meaning a debridement or an amputation at the time of your bypass, uh, 
uh, was beneficial in comparison to doing bypass first and then doing your your amputation or a uh, or your foot debridement in a more delayed manner after the perfusion had been maximized. We looked at the ACS Nisquip database for this. And what we saw is that leaving dead tissue or tissue that needed further debridement, even if not actively infected, was associated with increased weight rates of wound infection after lower extremity bypass. And so I do think that in all things being equal, if you're satisfied with your perfusion, getting rid of some of that uh, dead tissue or that, that um, latently infected tissue on the foot can be beneficial uh, in terms of minimizing the seeding of the lymphatics and ultimately your incisions and wounds. So I'll give one case here, and this sort of represents the maybe the worst case scenario of, a, of what can happen with surgical site infections. This is a 68-year-old female who came up to our emergency department with acute left lower extremity limb ischemia and a thrombosed left limb of an axillary bifemoral bypass. She had had a lot of work done previous to coming up to our emergency department over the years. She had a left iliofemoral bypass failed, had a left fem pop with PTFE failed, and a left fem AT all indwelling, which had failed. She was a former smoker, but she clearly had a threatened limb. And I took her to the operating room for a, a redo right axillary graft to left profunda bypass. I routed basically a new right to left fem fem in a, uh, uh, to her left profunda, which seemed to be the only you know, reasonable outflow vessels. She did reasonably well post-operatively and discharge, discharge tone post-operative day number seven. So she comes back for the three week visit looking great. All wounds are you know, he well healed, perfusion's excellent. But then she calls and seven comes back for a seven week post-op visit with drainage from the right flank at the site of the cut down onto the previous ax fem graft uh, where she did have a small hematoma and drainage from the left groin. She'd been dealing with this for five days. A PCP had prescribed antibiotics without calling for us and calling us and we um, admitted her directly from clinic. This is not exactly her incision, but this is basically identical to what hers looked like. And you can see here in the two pictures, the second and third ones on the right, she has a little air and fluid around that left limb of that graft coming down to the femoral artery and farther down the thigh where that graft comes towards the more distal profunda, she has an obvious you know, enhancing abscess. So we took her to the operating room, did initial just a sepsis control procedure, opened all the infected wounds, used half-strength betadine and Dakin's dressing, cleaned everything up, vacked her lower extremity fasciotomy wounds, which had once healed and then reopened secondary to edema. And then a few days later, took her for an extra anatomic revascularization of the left side with a left axillary to above knee popliteal bypass, which we did via lateral approach in order ultimately a few days later to allow an explant of the infected portion of her axillary bifemoral graft, including the old right limb and the new left limb that I had placed. All her cultures, other than an initial clinic culture, which showed some, some very weak diphtheroids, uh, had um, came back negative. Of course, she had been on antibiotics for a long time. Nevertheless, we had ID involved and on big gun IV and then IV antibiotics. Ultimately came through this with wounds looking pretty good, discharged on hospital day 20. So this is still the same case. Six months later, after coming after the initial bypass, she's now on suppressive doxycycline, good wound perfusion, a patent graft, and she comes back. She's doing well then. I'm kind of we're kind of congratulating ourselves, and she comes back nine months after the initial bypass with a thrombosed left axillary to pop popliteal bypass. Fortunately, my partner, Nini Zhang, was on call and had to deal with this one. So she thrombectomized the graft and dealt with an outflow stenosis. And after I came back in town, I was, had the, the luxury of looking at this and saying, oh, great. She's got no evidence of, re, of, of reinfection in her left groin, despite the, given the way that we had treated this, which was maybe the only upside of, of, of her, hot, of her uh, course at this point. So this, this just outlines you know, some of the extensive procedures that can be required in the cases of the worst case scenario graft infection. So I think we, I'll you know, come to just a few closing thoughts. 
And we can get back to treatment of graft infection if it's of interest to any of the audience and we wanna go through some of the options. But I think it's fair to say that wound complications after bypass and any groin procedure are a significant obstacle. We really need to maintain our di diligence and utilize all opportunities for improvement at an individual, a team and a systems level. I think it's very important that payers and the regulators really um, come to realize that we need good risk stratification. And we need to insist on this when, when disease specific bundling strategies are imposed on us. I think they, those really need to be considered. They, these are complex patients, not with usual expected outcomes. I actually think we need innovation and need to make this a research priority. And overall, we need to maintain and improve our skills and judgment in lower extremity bypass management, including the complications that we need to continue to transmit to our trainees and our surgical teams. So I'd be happy to take any initial questions on, um, on sort of this broad overview and, and we can get back to some slides and strategies for dealing with graft infection if it's of interest to the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Will. That was great. That was a great overview. And I cringe when I see those pictures because I have patients that, you know, look very similar. So um, you're not alone in your struggles. Um, and I don't think any of us are. I think maybe what we'll do is, is take the questions at the end, but I'd like to remind the audience to enter any questions that you have in the Q&A so, um, so that we can ask uh, the questions to our speakers. And I'm watching for them very carefully. So uh, I think we'll move on to the next talk, uh, which is by Dr. Atif Bakai, who is Division Chief of Ascension Illinois Vascular Surgery. He's also Chair of the Vascular Medicine Committee and of the Vascular Surgery Fellowship. He's talked to wound management with neck pressure therapy. You ready, Atif? Yep. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen here. So I'm going to talk about uh, prophylactic wound management with negative pressure therapy. Um, it's just kind of a, 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 a new thing. I, I mean, when, when, when we were in fellowship, um, we never had this. And so, you know, I think this has kind of been a great advancement in our field. And, uh, and, and uh, I'm going to sh share some data with you on, on what's been um, done in regards to using uh, wound uh, uh, negative pressure therapy for, for wounds. I have no conflicts of interest. So uh, looking at the literature, um, there, was, there was a paper published in Journal of Vascular Surgery in 2018, which was a randomized control trial, which was looking evaluating negative pressure therapy to decrease vascular growing complications. The, the primary endpoint that was looked at was a major wound complication rate. Secondary endpoint was looking at length of stay, reoperation, readmission, and hospital costs. And just a little bit about uh, you know, vascular growing complications. As we all know, this is not something that's, um, that's uncommon. As Dr. Robinson had stated in his talk very nicely that uh, you know, the, the incidence of vascular surgical site infections is. Uh, is in the in the literature is reported anywhere between 17 and 44 percent, and I think that um, you know to, to his point, you know as as we go further along and and we follow these patients, I think that you know these patients just like they're married to us, their risk of having complications is also married to us, and we end up seeing them, uh, you know, the, uh, more more commonly as they as they get further along, you know, risk factors associated with it, as he had mentioned, you know, obesity, reoperation, emergent surgery. Uh, prosthetic grafts, people that have diabetes, chronic kidney disease. And I think one of the things that probably gets very often neglected is their nutrition status. Uh, many of these patients have really bad nutrition at baseline. And, uh, and I think that's a huge component of, um, of, of why we see uh, these patients having uh, these wound complications. Uh, there's been meta-analysis done, which have demonstrated that uh, reduction in wound infections in ortho and cardiac surgery from uh, from negative pressure uh, vac therapy, but uh, you know, there prior to this, there, the studies on groin infections were 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 not really there, and so um, I think this is well, this paper presented was one of the one of the first papers that talked about um, using negative pressure uh, 
uh, VAC therapy in, in patients and vascular surgery patients. In this paper, basically the eligibility criteria was if there were 18 years um, uh, or, or above elective groin operations, um, you know, for inflow, outflow, and cut down for access procedures. Um, the exclusion criteria in this paper where they excluded people that had emergency surgery or were unable to provide consent. Um, the intervention, the, what, when it was performed, the incisions were closed in layers with vicryl, skin was closed with either monocryl or staples, depending on surgeon discretion. Um, the risk was assessed. They were high risk if, if they had any of the following, uh, if they had a BMI greater than 30, uh, significant panis, pregnancy of any fungus in the panis, reoperative surgery, placement of prosthetic graft, poor nutrition, uh, BMI less than 18 or there were cachectic appearing, uh, any kind of immunosuppression or they had a hemoglobin A1C that was greater than eight. If they were low risk, uh, then they, they, they were treated uh, with gauze and tegaderm. Dressing was replaced uh, by the gauze on day two and changed daily. And if they were uh, high risk, they were randomized to the uh, to, to, to the low risk dressing or a provena, which was left in place for five days. And then, then after that, they um, they just had a, a gauze changed uh, until they were discharged. The primary endpoint that they was looked at was basically looking at major groin uh, wound complications at 30 days, complications including skin dehiscence, lymph leakage, uh, infection, or hematoma. Major complications would be any complication that required IV antibiotics, reoperation, or readmission. And they were assessed daily until discharge, and then within 10 to 14 days when they came back for staple removal, and then within, within about a month um, afterwards. The wound infection was treated with antibiotics or open, was at the discretion of the surgeon. So, um, you know, a little bit of, uh, of, of subjectivity there um, when, when, when you're looking at it. Secondary endpoints looked at was like to stay, 30 day length of stay, reoperation within 30 days, um, either in the OR. Uh, bedside procedures did not count. Um, or readmission for uh, groin wound complications and costs. Um, if patients had bilateral incisions, each groin received, a, 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 you know, they, they were basically one received the control and one was the treatment arm. So they would look at the same patients and treat one with gauze and one with the provena. Those groins with contralateral infections were excluded from the secondary points as not to be um, looking at, you know, additional length of stay because of the, of the one that, that, that actually caused the complication. So uh, the, looking at the results, there was 122 patients that had essentially 147 incisions. 123 incisions were considered high risk. 62 were randomized to standard treatment. One was uh, excluded because of graft failure and uh, one had a fatal MI. Uh, so, so total there was 60 high risk. Um, there were standard dressings. And then there was uh, 59 that were high risk uh, per, per Provena dressings. Um, 24 incisions were considered low risk. And uh, there, was, there was a few that did that that didn't want to participate. So characteristics, when you looked at them on both arms, they were generally uh, evenly matched. Uh, low risk was a little older than the high risk patients, but the Provena patients were a little younger, but had higher BMIs. And when you look at the, uh, the wound complications rate um, in, the, in the low risk patients, there was about 4.8%, one out of 21 patients had a wound complication. In the high risk patients with standard uh, dressings, it was about 26.7% versus the Provena, which had 11.9%. Um, the major wound complication rates, um, you know, in the low risk population, again, just 4.8%. In the high risk with standard dressings, it was about 25%. And uh, with the Provena, was 8.5%. So um, it looked. <clears throat> Looking at this overall, uh, the low risk patients with the wound infection rates, um, basically 4.8%. And then the, the standard dressings had about 21.6%, whereas Provena had about 10.1%, of which five were considered major complications. Um, so if you look at the secondary endpoints, people that had bilateral incisions, there was about 25 patients that had bilateral incisions. One was low risk, 24 were high risk. Standard dressings had um, had nine complications, of which eight were considered major. The Provena dressing had five complications, all of which were considered major. So, in basic, in, in the in the in the discussion of this article, basically what the, what they talked about was that there's a significant reduction in major wound complications compared to standard dressings, as well as reduction reduced need for reoperation and readmission. When you talk about using uh, um, uh, negative pressure therapy. 
length of stay was not necessarily significantly uh, different. But looking at the average savings, when you look at the, the, the cost of the patient or the patient being in the hospital um, and, the, and the amount of additional procedures and stuff that they require, the average savings with a Provena was about $6,000 per case. It's unclear mechanism, but, 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 but I think a lot of this has to do with the fact that you've created a barrier. Um, you know, the sponge has some silver component and you know, whether that contributes is, is, can be debatable. But I think it has a lot more to do with number one, just reducing the edema. Uh, and, and, and even though the, uh, uh, the Provena, the dressings don't really put out that much uh, in regards to actually you know, um, drainage, but just having that negative pressure therapy, and I think uh, creating a suction allows for the for the skin, I think, to heal, and then uh, and it's sealed and it's sterile, and so you basically have a sterile dressing that's left on for a longer period of time. The limitations of the study, I think, in my opinion, is first of all, it's single center, it's not blinded. There's several factors which were at the surgeon's discretion, and also um, they didn't really look at operative time. In, the, in this, uh, you know, whether the cases were longer versus shorter and, uh, and how that would contribute. Because we, as we all know, certainly that's a, that's a contributing factor um, uh, in, in, in what happens with these patients. Um, they didn't look at EBL, uh, you know, in, in cases in which, you know, you had a, a tremendous amount of EBL, whether there was transfusions given or not. As we know that, that, that all that contributes to our wound healing um, as, as when you give transfusions, there is a degree of immunosuppression that occurs, um, and, and whether they had, you know, other other risk factors, you know, versus coronary artery disease, COPD, chronic kidney disease, whether it was smokers versus not smokers. So, you know, I, I think that there, there's definitely points of discussion to be looked at, but but I think overall, if you just they just just looking at it, they did show that there was a significant uh, benefit of cost savings um, per case, um, and which is basically just kind of outlined here. Uh, and described, um, you know, basically what we've just talked about. There's, there's an, another paper which I wanted to discuss, which was uh, using closed incision negative pressure therapy, uh, reducing surgical site infections of vascular surgeries, which is a, pro a prospective randomized control trial, uh, which was published in the European Journal of Endovascular Surgery. Again, this was a prospective randomized control with two centers, which were um, the, the control arm where, where, where there was a Cosmore uh, dressing applied versus the study arm, which was the Provena. The primary endpoint was occurrence of surgical site infections. Secondary endpoint was device-related complications, um, skin laceration, allergic reactions, reduced mobility, pain due to suction. 204 patients who uh, underwent surgery um, between July 2015 and uh, May of 2017. Eligibility criteria was that they had longitudinal groin incisions. They had to have significant comorbidity profile. Um, including smoking, active, or history of um, cardiac risk factors, um, hypertension, coronary artery disease, prior MI, and metabolic disorders. Exclusion if there were less than 18 or pediatric population, they were excluded if they were uh, pregnant, or if they had a local skin infection or had any kind of immunosuppression, they were excluded. There was no emergency procedure included in this. And if there were bilateral, in this case, uh, paper, only one groin was randomized. So they did not, they did not use, um, you know, one control and one uh, um, one study arm. <clears throat> so again, there was 204 patients that were randomized. Uh, 98 were in the Provena arm, 90 were in the control. Um, their their pre-op preps, they, they were shaved and prepped with polyalcohol, 30 minutes prior to incision, received their appropriate antibiotics. Incision was against closed with layers with absorbable suture. Skin was closed with absorbable, non-absorbable, or staples. Um, again, the, the control arm was using the Cosmore dressing change daily intervention. Arm got Provena, which was removed five to seven days post-op, then no further dressing was applied. Um, they were not allowed to shower for the first seven days. The wound was assessed on post-op day seven, 15, and 30. So the total, there was, there was 43 surgical site infections. There was 13 in the Provena arm, 30 in the control group. The vast majority of surgical site infections were the ones that were just limited to the dermis. Um, and then that, that was eight in the Provena arm and 24 in the, um, the, the uh, Cosmore dressing. And then the ones that extended to the subcutaneous skin layers, uh, there was five in the Provena and four in the control. Um, there, was, there was none in the Provena arm that actually involved the artery itself. And there was two in the control. <clears throat> 
So in their discussion, basically they showed that basically uh, using uh, closed incision negative pre uh, pressure therapy uh, was more profound for reoperative groins with uh, patients that have BMI greater than 25 and had severe PAD. <laughs> Limitations were obviously that this was the study was not blinded and they did not actually assess the wound until post-op day seven, five to seven. Again, this is also highlighted here. Uh, basically looking at the surgical site infections and based in summary, basically showed that closed incision negative pressure therapy was associated with reduced incidence of surgical site infections when compared to the control group. And that high-risk patients could benefit from this to help reduce the risk of surg um, surgical site infections. The last paper I looked at basically was a reduction of groin com wound complications in vascular surgery patients. Again, using um, closed incision negative pressure therapy. This was a prospective randomized single institutional study, which was published in the International Wound Journal in 2017. Um, again, it's similar to the previous study um, using Cosmore dressings. In, uh, there were 71 patients. The Provena, there was 58. The primary endpoint was wound healing complication at days five through seven and post-op day 30. There was no secondary endpoint. Um, inclusion criteria if the surgery involved access to the conformal artery and at least one of the following. They had risk factors that were, um, you know, age greater than 50, diabetes, renal sufficiency, malnutrition, obesity, or COPD. Uh, there was 100 patients with 129 groin wounds, 29 were bilateral, incisions were closed with Vicryl, and then skin clamping device, and they all had a drain placed. Uh, wound was graded based on the classification as I outlined before. Uh, evaluation, evaluative post operative day five to seven, uh, and at day 30, uh, there was 35 total, um, five were in, uh, in the, um, in the, in the, there, there, was, there, there was 35 infections, five were in the uh, Provena group, 30 in the control group. So the single variable risk analysis, basically what this showed is that uh, pa patients that had a length of incisions that were greater than eight centimeters or operative and operative time were risk factors associated with uh, higher risk of wound, wound infections. Um, people that uh, the, the, the length of the incision certainly was uh, showed the greatest predictive of positive predictive value of patients developing infections. Patients tend to have more infections at 30 days. Um, and, I, and I think that this is something that I have always asked is that, you know, the, the, uh, the first line Provena wound vaccine that we currently had only, the, the battery only lasted for about seven days. And so you had to remove it at seven days, but, you know, does removing it open the possibility for more infections? Um, or, 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 you know, is there a possibility of maybe leaving it on longer um, and would, would, would that change anything? Um, developing a scoring system. So they, they looked at all the different risk factors and then basically said that if you have, um, if you have multiple risk factors and you score eight plus points, then, then those patients would benefit from, from using a Provena. And so the, the high risk factors which were seen were basically reoperative surgery, prosthetic vascular graft, age greater than 50, BMI greater than 30. They had a significant panis, malnutrition, smoker, immunosuppression, cardiac risk factors. Uh, COPD, they had uncontrolled diabetes with an A1C greater than eight, chronic kidney disease, dyslipidemia, hypercholesterolemia, hyper homocystinemia. I mean, when I look at this list, I'm thinking like every single one of my patients has almost every single one of these things happening. Uh, and so, you know, this not, you know, if it, this stuff adds up pretty quickly. So, so, you know, does this really help us? Um, these are, these are a few of my patients that I've taken care of um, uh, recently. Uh, the one on the left was a patient that I had that was pretty cachectic and, was, and malnourished that had an, um, that had an occluded aorta uh, came in uh, that ended up requiring uh, basically a aorta bifem bypass in order to try to revascularize him. So, um, so, in, so what I, what I, what I typically, typically would do is basically place the a Provena on the, on the midline as well as in both groins. Um, the one in the, on the bottom is a patient that also was significantly malnourished and cachectic, had a bad uh, wound on his ankle. Um, that ended up uh, requiring a, uh, a, a a FEMPOP and SI2 bypass. And uh, it's always funny because my partner um, who, who believes in doing reverse and, and me that I was trained in, in doing in SI2, we always uh, have this argument be basically that, you know, when, when you have a, when you have a, uh, a growing complication or you have a saphenectomy complication and in, in, in patients that you do in SI2 on, you know, many times you're staring right at the graph. And so he always argues that it's probably better to reverse it and uh, 
and uh, tunnel them anatomically. Um, and I think that I think it's kind of user discretion. But if you're if you're when we talked about um, Dr. Robinson had also talked about was also looking at doing skip incisions versus doing one long incision. Again, I I, I did skip incisions here, but the the, the uh, I apply the back across the whole thing um, so that I could just use one. That the one on the top right was a very interesting patient, which was a um, which was a 480 pound guy that came in with a abdominal aortic aneurysm that um, was was seven centimeters. Unfortunately, he did not have um, an, you know a, any standard um, uh, endograft options, and so he ended up uh, requiring to have an open repair. Uh, and uh, and so you know again, patients with significant BMIs, he, his panis was actually uh, when he was stand was was basically hanging down to his mid thighs, and so I would argue that it's actually easier to do the open operation than try to do a groin cut down to do it to deliver an endovascular um, uh, attempt, even if he had one. So you know, but but applying this, you know, he actually did very well and and uh, and was able to um, to heal the heal that wound. So, um, you know, other areas I think that where, where, where it could be debatable, I, I, I've, I've utilized using Provena therapy in patients that you do the pop, uh, posterior approach for popliteal aneurysms. I think it's a very high tensile um, strength area where there's a lot of forces that are occurring in which um, that there's, uh, they're prone to skin breakdown. Uh, I, a patient I had, I actually did use it. Uh, he had, he, he, was, he was very morphinoid and he had a, um, he was very tall and, and I applied it on him. and. Uh, and, and, and actually helped with his wound healing. Um, and I think that, you know, should we be leaving these on longer than one week? Um, in other specialties in ortho and plastics, they, they will leave them on longer. They, they've actually created Provenas, which are um, have a battery life of, uh, for, of, of almost two weeks. And so I know that in ortho and plastics, they, they will apply that and, and leave it on for two weeks. And, and you know, I, I don't think we have data on it, but in, antidotally, I think that, um, I, you know, the, the time that I see the patient's wound, once I take the Provena off on day seven, it always looks pretty good. Then when they come back, you know, a month later, it's like everything is just broken apart. And so, you know, I always wonder if it's, if it would be worthwhile to keep these on longer. That's all I have. Thank you very much, Atif. That was great. Um, I love the Provena. So yeah. our next speaker is uh, Dr. Greg Weston, who's going to be talking about creating an SSI and wound care bundle within integration into the EMR. Um, and Greg, uh, Dr. Weston is an assistant professor uh, in, in the Division of Vascular Surgery at Indiana University. Dr. Weston. Thank you. Uh, so I uh, apologize in advance that I think my presentation is going to be short on some of the great um, case-based um, uh, uh, detail that I think many of us as surgeons uh, love seeing and that was great in Dr. Robinson's and Dr. Pakai's presentations. I'm going to be sort of talking through some of the, the evidence that I was looking through uh, with the, the people mentioned here who helped you know, in preparing some of this, uh, one of our medical students and one of our residents as we were trying to sort through uh, the task of how would you implement um, a, a bundle for preventing surgical site infections in uh, an EMR-based system? You know, how, how would you translate all this evidence into something that could be implemented regularly to um, uh, make it happen every time? And uh, so I'm going to go through some of the studies that we looked at as we did that. So um, obviously our, our enemy here is the, is the surgical wound, uh, the, particularly the groin. And as Dr. Robinson outlined, the particular challenge is these really long uh, incisions in areas of uh, you know, high uh, division of lymphatic tissue and things of that sort that um, are uh, particularly challenging when compared to uh, surgical, uh, other surgical sites around the body. Um, and when we ask sort of what interventions reduce surgical site infections, you, know, you can look at surgical site infections in general. Um, and of course, at, at the lower extremity wound and, and the vascular surgery wounds in particular, we also have the challenges in our patients of 
of you know, our age and many comorbidities that make it somewhat worse than, than the general population of surgical site infections. But the long history of trying to look at uh, all kinds of interventions to reduce risk. And as I think I'll outline, I think we're, and as was said by our other speakers, still have uh, somewhat limited evidence for most of them. Um, and because of that uh, limited evidence for each individual intervention, uh, there's been, I think, increased attention in the past uh, decade or so to uh, focusing on bundling multiple interventions with the idea that, well, you know, maybe we haven't been able to demonstrate a clear benefit that reaches statistical significance for uh, intervention X uh, or for intervention Y, but maybe if we are doing both together, the combined effort will have a significant impact. And um, so that's the, the general idea of bundling and of getting people to pay attention, not just to one particular intervention, but to a whole spectrum of things that might help with the hope that all of them together could have a significant impact. An example of uh, a few um, that have tried, uh, looked at this in the vascular surgery space, um, here are just a couple of, of papers outlining some of the things that are included in these bundles. Um, in general, you know, antibiotics prior to incision, um, something about uh, hair removal, uh, something about um, how the skin is uh, prepared. And then some have uh, looked at uh, type of groin incision, uh, maintenance of normothermia intraoperatively, matron, maintenance of euglycemia, um, and then a few other uh, scattered interventions like um, chlorhexidine uh, uh, wipes or chlorhexidine showers uh, preoperatively, uh, trying to avoid uh, lots of activity in and out of the OR, opening and closing of the door um, as, a, as a route to infection, um, getting the urinary catheters out quickly. And so you know, each of these, these bundles is slightly different. Uh, the first three were um, in, in single institutions, and the fourth was actually a review of implementation of the uh, SKIP guidelines, so the general surgical uh, infection prevention guidelines. Um, and uh, th that study actually showed no, no benefit in, in uh, looking at uh, a large sample of places that had implemented those guidelines. But these other three did, um, in single institutions, uh, demonstrate some benefit. So the elements that go into each of these are slightly different, but there are some common themes, and so I'll go over those first. So the I think um, here's an example of how these bundles work. Um, you know, you uh, have, this is an example from New York, where they you know, had the hair clipping, chlorhexidine wipes, uh, assessment of the skin. They had a bunch of recommendations for intraoperative management about um, how to um, dissect tissue planes and maintain hemostasis and skin closure, and then uh, managing the dressing postoperatively. And, and so the, the bundles often span these multiple uh, time points throughout the, the care of the patient. So uh, that's another challenge we were thinking about as we're thinking about moving this towards an EMR implementation is that these happen uh, preoperatively, intraoperatively, and postoperatively. So trying to implement that into the EMR, I think that's one of the challenges I'll discuss a bit later. Okay, so uh, preoperative antibiotics. Uh, this is something we all, I think, talk about very regularly You know, with our uh, timeouts and things. I think there is... Um, good evidence for preoperative antibiotics. And uh, I highlighted some here in um, arterial reconstruction, a 2006 Cochrane review um, suggested a, a relative risk of you know, a quarter to a third of um, what it would be otherwise in patients who are getting uh, prophylactic antibiotics. So I think we all agree on this. Um, and the, the one element that I think we don't always highlight is that prophylaxis after 24 hours uh, does not seem to have any added benefit um, in the general population of patients with arterial reconstruction. So not thinking about patients who have, you know, concern about a graft infection or something like that. And then um, another review just uh, this year, uh, based on um, 36 prior articles, uh, recommended in vascular surgery to 
give the antibiotics within uh, 60 minutes before uh, incision and actually recommended a, a redosing if the procedure is more than four hours or there's more than a liter and a half of blood loss, which you know was something that I thought was uh, notable because four hours is usually significantly less than the time you would normally be redosing a lot of these antibiotics. Um, and first or second generation cephalosporins, as I think most institutions use, and Vank or Clinda if allergic. Skin prep is, is another area where I think there's um, moderate evidence, uh, you know, looking at uh, chlorhexidine uh, versus iodine and um, in a systematic review and meta-analysis with uh, over 16,000 patients, it did uh, suggest that chlorhexidine had a significantly lower risk of surgical site infection than iodine. And um, uh, Perhaps the best evidence, although or the best um, report, although this is based on less evidence, was for um, the sequential use of uh, iodine and chlorhexidine. Uh, suggested that that might be even better than one of them alone. Um, so that I thought was interesting, was something I had not uh, explored. But that was that was looking at uh, bacterial. Uh, decolonization of the surgical sites as opposed to this, the strict outcome of surgical site infection. Chlorhexidine baths. Um, I could not find good evidence to support this, although this is included in some of the bun bundles. Um, so, you know, the idea of bathing with chlorhexidine wipes or chlorhexidine showers or something of that sort. Um, I think we all have the intuition that some sort of uh, cleanliness before arriving in the OR is probably something that would benefit a lot of our patients. Um, but you know, trying to operationalize that to get it to how do you how do you give patients the right instructions to get them um, uh, you know well cleaned before they come to the OR? I think we haven't um, demonstrated that yet. Controlling um, uh, blood sugar is another area where I think we all know that um, hyperglycemia is a big problem for a lot of our patients and leads to a lot of negative outcomes. There's really strong evidence that patients who are hyperglycemic do poorly, as you can see highlighted here, um, you know, higher risk of surgical site infections, longer hospital stays, uh, greater mortality, we know worse outcomes with uh, arterial interventions, but that again tends to be mostly observational data based on you know patients who are hyperglycemic are sick and they therefore tend to do poorly. And the um, uh, uh, when you look at these data, um, those without diabetes are actually the ones who are driving some of these effects because when the non-diabetic patient becomes hyperglycemic, then they're particularly ill. So um, actually, when you look at whether the intervention of strict glycemic control makes a difference for this, the outcomes are uh, not as strong. So um, their uh, 2009 Cochrane review found that with strict glycemic control, as you might expect, you'd have more hypoglycemic events, although those didn't uh, lead to mortality as far as they could demonstrate. Um, there was a uh, meta-analysis in cardiac surgery that demonstrated that stricter glycemic control reduced sternal wound infections, um, which was, uh, and there's, there's some of observational data in liver transplant patients suggesting that um, the uh, better glycemic control uh, led to a better outcomes sort of perioperatively and then at one year in terms of uh, mortality. But a randomized trial of patients uh, having coronary bypass uh, found that the intense glycemic control uh, made no difference in diabetic patients. It did have a, it was, it did make a significant difference in non-diabetic patients, but not in the diabetic patients. So again, the question of whether we should be really pushing uh, glycemic control lower to reduce um, surgical site infections versus what I think we all do, you know, some element of um, glycemic control for diabetic patients who are undergoing vascular surgery. Um, 
I don't think that there's clear evidence for that. So when we're thinking about what would modify our practice, obviously we should be taking care of our diabetic patients. Um, but the thing that these evidence seem to suggest might make the biggest difference is uh, monitoring for hyperglycemia in our non-diabetic patients. And um, you know, presumably that doesn't mean doing finger sticks on them uh, multiple times a day. It's something that's going to happen when they're uh, systemically ill. So uh, I don't think we have clear evidence that we should be pushing the limit on glycemic control either intraoperatively or postoperatively. Um, managing temperature, uh, both intraoperatively and uh, some evidence for doing this preoperatively, um, may be something that uh, could be it has been included in some of these bundles. So pre-warming patients by in the like in the preoperative area, uh, there's uh, some evidence that this reduces uh, surgical site infections and um, uh, low temperatures intraoperatively. Again, this could be due to um, uh, you know, a bias of those patients being being sick and otherwise doing poorly, but low intraoperative temperatures produ um, predict surgical site infections. Uh, there was some discussion of transverse versus longitudinal incisions. Uh, in brief, I think there is some evidence for transverse incisions, um, but it is not as uh, strong as uh, as some think. I think the strongest evidence might be from this. Uh, most or recent uh, meta-analysis uh, that suggested a uh, relative risk uh, higher in uh, those having uh, transverse incisions. Although again, most of the, this data is uh, non-randomized and uh, the one randomized trial mentioned here uh, did not reach uh, significance. Suture type, as Dr. Robinson mentioned, has some low quality evidence um, for maybe closing subcuticularly. Negative pressure wound therapy, I think, has already been discussed. Um, and I think I would just add to that the Cochrane review from 2019 uh, that uh, showed that a relative risk of 0.67 uh, in favor of using negative pressure wound therapy, um, but low certainty evidence, and this was downgraded uh, twice for a, a very serious risk of bias. So I think we're still um, in a situation where this is not, um, uh, you know, there's, there's a trend towards benefit, but it's not the strongest evidence. In terms of managing wounds postoperatively, um, there was a review from uh, the Asia Pacific um, infection control group uh, citing a lack of high quality evidence and their strongest recommendation was using aseptic technique for dressing changes, um, which, um, you know, I think there's lots of variation in practice about managing a post-operative wound, but no clear guidance about, uh, you know, how one might do that to um, most reduce the risk. And managing, uh, evaluating um, other interventions like using silver containing dressings I, uh, has not shown significant benefit. So thinking about uh, translating this into um, an order set, you know, how to use in the EMR, we have things that you might do that you might order in clinic for a patient uh, preoperatively or on the floor if they're an inpatient, uh, like doing a chlorhexidine bath or some other form of, of hygiene of things that one might implement in the preoperative area, uh, like hair clipping or preoperative warming, which um, you know is is something that often is is not a location that is driven by EMR orders, uh, but to the extent that you could get the preoperative area to uh, be attentive to EMR orders, you might be able to implement those there. Intraoperatively, again, is an area where I think a lot of the attention is usually not driven by um, EMR based orders. And so um, having an implementation there, I think might be best done as in many institutions in by including in a timeout or in a, you know, divisional or institutional protocol for some sort of reminder to um, the anesthesia team, nursing team and surgical team about um, some of these uh, interventions. Most of the ones we've talked about today are intraoperative interventions. And then postoperative uh, interventions, 
you know, the things that might happen on the floor to generally come down to the glycemic control, which strict control, um, as I mentioned, does not have uh, strong evidence, but having some sort of glycemic control is probably advised. And then wound care, where uh, not having a clear um, best strategy, it's not clear what would include, uh, what, what would be best to include. But these are the four areas that if one were trying to generate a, a bundle to be EMR driven, um, you could be implementing a um, strategy in each of these areas. So, you know, to my, um, uh, uh, I think I, I was very uh, disappointed to, to do some of this review because I felt uh, frustrated uh, going through all this evidence, identifying lots of risks and predictors for surgical site infections, but not necessarily identifying strong randomized trial evidence for the interventions that might prevent them. And uh, I hope that this idea of bundling is um, efficacious. Uh, I think there you know, are these some um, evidence for bundles, but I think the evidence for bundles, if you expanded them in the same way that you looked at a systematic review or meta-analysis for each of the individual components, may also show that each of these any given bundles doesn't necessarily have um, great evidence. And, and my sense is that these bundles probably uh, reflect some bias of the sustained attention of the interventionalists, of the institutions, uh, to paying attention to uh, patients, uh, patient care and good hygiene and things like that more than, than these given interventions. Uh, moreover, using the EMR to drive these uh, bundles um, is, I think, somewhat limited um, based on uh, you know, how the EMRs are implemented in terms of implementing orders in those different settings and uh, because we don't have clear um, best interventions to drive them. So my um, hope is that we can continue research, including bundles at each of our institutions, using a bundle with some of these elements, but then using that bundle combined with randomizing an element of the bundle um, to really generate stronger evidence for whether, uh, for example, um, a negative pressure wound therapy has an added benefit in the setting of attentive uh, care to neuroglycemia and um, uh, uh, you know, type of incision and, and all these other elements that we think are beneficial. I'll stop there and I think we can move on to- Great, all our thank you very questions. much. Thank you very much, Greg. So I'd like to thank our panelists. We, we really are out of time. There's one question in the Q&A, which I think we could um, discuss for about two minutes. If you guys wanna give it a shot, just a quick uh, question to each of you. Uh, over the years, so this is from uh, Dr. Michael Goh. Over the years, he's gone from early reoperation for early lymph leaks to observation, uh, to VAC, uh, lymphocentigraphy, flap coverage, and then back again. So kind of gone all over uh, trying everything for these early lymph leaks. How do you handle early lymph leaks? Do you operate re early or do you observe? Greg, go first. Operate early or observe? I tend to uh, observe in the early lymph leak. Adif, operate early or observe? Uh, I tend to operate early and then consider doing a muscle flap to try to get a, um, a, a vascular bed to try to help seal it and then back it. Will? If it seems really low volume, I tend to observe and put pressure on it. And then if it slows up a little bit, maybe back it. If it's any reasonable volume, lots of dressing saturated, I'd say operate early. The graft is almost always exposed but reclosing it over and putting a vac on at that time seems to work as long as it's truly just lymph fluid and no evidence of infection. That's sort of how I've evolved, but I, I'm not aware of good evidence there. Uh, I don't think we have any. Uh, Manju? Yeah. yeah, I was actually going to answer Michael in a text to say this symposium was mostly about prevention, but 
Uh, I agree. If it's if it's uh, a very small volume leak, I do put them in bed with the leg elevated. I try try to limit mobility, and I also uh, observe uh, if it is just a small part of the wound that has opened up. I've actually gone to using a tiny little stoma bag, so that the surrounding skin doesn't get uh, affected. And if it doesn't settle down, then I go with what Artif uh, said. I open up, wash up, clean up. You can do as much lymphocentigraphy, you're not going to get every lymphatic. So I tend to leave the wound open at that stage with a sartorius flap, a muscle cover, and then back it. Back yeah. that open wound and let it heal secondarily rather than try to close it. That's my algorithm. Yeah. I do the same. I do the same. Um, I, I like to observe if possible. I do think they can stop if it's small. Um, but if it's, uh, again, like, uh, like Will said, and I think everybody basically said, if you're saturating four by fours and changing the dressing two or three times a day, that's not going to close. And then, then you need to operate to prevent infection. Uh, one last question. Would you ever uh, use lymphatic manual lymph drainage to help the lymph leak? I've never done that. I've, I've only done, done that, that for lymphedema. I think it might actually make it worse instead of helping it. I don't know. Yeah, I've, I have I, I have not done that. But can I ask a burning question quickly of the three panelists? Please. So uh, uh, I know the Pravina, that the Pravina has been user-friendly for the whole five days, you know, the early iterations of this system, we would send the patient home with them and then they would call within 24 hours and the canister would be full. So what about, uh, I firmly believe is, you know, the, the, the crease needs to be, kept, the groin crease is what needs to be kept dry. And whether you do it by putting the Pravina in a vac in place or what I want to is in a lot of these patients, something in between, which is like the Aquacel dressing, which is silver impregnated. And I agree with you, it's not the silver, it's the fact that it sticks into the groin crease and keeps it dry. And mm -hmm. I send the patient, we, we've got a little informational booklet. We teach the patient's family to change it every five days, to watch for strike through drainage and send us pictures. And I send them home with another three or four to change every five days. And that's where, you know, you are on for longer than five days. I do think you need to keep that area dry for longer than five days. So that's what I do is is send them home with those dressings so that means they're keeping it dry for about three weeks or so yeah i i think um that intervention that you're talking about is one of the most challenging and probably the most beneficial things for our patients which is the communication between the vascular team and the patient and family and i think you know if you have the healthy, um, uh, with it patient who's uh, motivated to take care of themselves. And, you know, they're probably going to do well with any kind of dressing. You know, you could tell them to just put a dry gauze in their groin and they would keep it clean and they would change it regularly and they'd probably do really well. And the challenge that I struggle with, and I'm, I'm sure, um, you know, you, many of you do is the patient who is not in that category, you know, and then should they be in a in some sort of rehab facility where a maybe not great, you know, nursing aide is checking on them and putting a dressing in their groin, should we be educating their family? Or, you know, I think one of the potential benefits of something like negative pressure therapy is uh, taking that out of the equation for someone that you don't think is going to be able to manage that well. And I think the Achilles heel with that is when the vac fails, then you've got a sloppy wet sponge sitting on the groin. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so again, if you have someone who's in a situation that you don't think is going to be reliable, I worry about that being the thing that might happen if they're not paying attention to their <laughs> dressing. Exactly, exactly. And as, as uh, Artif showed that, you know, it's the, the Provena, it's not that it drains 500 cc or 300 cc. It's not so much the drainage. I think it serves the purpose when it works of keeping the area uh, dry in the crease. Yeah. Yeah. We actually sometimes act, uh, started actually sending people home with an act, an extra battery pack um, with them so mm -hmm. that they, they basically, when one battery runs out, they, they plug in the other one and they, 
um, and they and they use that. I, I think you guys hit the nail on the head. I think it's just keeping a sterile dressing and um, and and then and that pa taking the patient variable out of it. Um, I, I think the most frustrating thing for us is when the thing starts beeping and uh, that you get yeah. about a million phone calls about, well, I can't get this, I can't sleep, I can't get this thing to stop beeping. And then, uh, you know, ultimately you just say, okay, well, just, just, just take it off, you know, and uh, that's the only way it's going to stop beeping. So, um, yeah, but I, I think uh, to your Aquacell point, I use a lot of Aquacell too, I think for that same reason to basically allow for a good seal um, and to, to, and to allow to, to, to control the moisture. Yeah. Well, this right. was a really I great discussion and I think we could probably go on for another hour or two. Uh, but, uh, it is now 10 after the hour and we probably should go. So I would like to thank all of our panelists, uh, Dr. Robinson, Dr. Um, Bakai and Dr. Weston. Thank you so much for uh, running through all of that um, data and giving us an overview of uh, wound and the challenges of wound infections and how to prevent them. And uh, um, I'd like to remind the audience that we do have one more uh, educational uh, webinar in our series in June, and the topic is to be determined. So watch your email for that. And once again, thank you to our sponsor 3M uh, for allowing us to put this on. Without their sponsorship, we really wouldn't be able to do this. So. Thank you all very much and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you all. Thank you. This hatchet is not yet buried, so. <laughs>